live. Okay. Orly, you could see you could let Paula in. Yep, I let everybody in. Yep, okay. I'm good. How's your morning going? Wonderful, thank you. Good. Finally got my hair cut. So this is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so excited for our soiree in your backyard. Yes, it's going to be fun. Oh my goodness, what a good time yesterday. It was. It was really, I really enjoyed it. And I didn't realize the impact that we make, you know? Oh my gosh. I what did you do? It. Tell me. I missed just we logged had, in. <laughs> we had the empowerment, female empowerment master oh, yeah. yesterday. And I think was- Patty got off before the crying started. <laughs> um, and sorry, I understand you guys could hear me while I was walking. I apologize. Oh, it's okay. No, that's okay. It was fine, but it but it was really impactful, and um, that's what yeah. it's all about. Yeah, yeah. I heard a lot of people really share their innards, and that is a testimony to the trust factor. Yes, yes. absolutely. And I'm so glad that my intuition told me not to break up into the breakout rooms just allow everybody yeah that was you that was totally you (laughs) yeah yeah so good morning everybody we have another gorgeous morning yes it's going to be up to 69 degrees today yay oh wow okay (laughs) that changes what i'm wearing (laughs) i I asked alexa and then i put this on so (laughs) i just want to uh say good morning to all your beautiful ladies today Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Or see I'm just going to run and get my tea. Hang on. Mary Beth, go do your thing. I'll let people in. Okay. I'm just trying to get us live. Let's do I something. See I see you have Kobe there. He slept late today. I had to wake him up. You're kidding. What kind of yeah. a dog sleeps late? I know <laughs> he's just so happy and I get him so tired. <laughs> right. What is he sleeping in the dining room or? No, in the, yeah, in the crate. Ooh. Is this your fur grandbaby? This is my fur baby. Fur baby. Oh my <laughs> goodness. What is your fur baby? This is Kobe. He's, so he's three months, he's four months now. Sharp teeth. Oh my <laughs> God. Here, this is, will show you all the. Oh my goodness. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I have like, I look like a, I have track needles all over my. Oh, look at the energy. Isn't that amazing? I love yeah. it. Yeah. I give them calm uh, pills at night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> These little calm things. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah, they're called drugs. She's drugs. Yeah. <laughs> so, Kevin, tell uh, it how it is. Hey, Kevin. Hi. Good morning. Good morning. Katie said, "If you're ever talking to Paula, Kevin is always there." <laughs> I have to talk about Kevin behind his back. Yeah. <laughs> Not that I would have anything to say anyway, Kevin. So. No, that's right. Never. All right, Mary Beth. Orly and I are good, and Paula, we're we're good. Yeah, yeah we're we are we are live. Um, one thing I want to bring up that I heard yesterday from three, I think two people that were in the book club, and um, dropped out, was that they felt it was um, they were looking to embrace the systems, and I think I, I I have to clarify why they dropped out, but I think they felt that they were top producers here. And that was, it was beyond their scope. And I'm really sorry to hear that because, um, and they, they started their own, which is great because they can really delve into it, the three people. But wow. this is about what we need out of this book. So as we go through the systems, if anybody has you know, questions or things that they want to tap into, this, that, this is what this is about. So please don't feel that um, the sharing is about ego or, it's about inspiring and motivating you to where you can go and the steps to take to get there. Did they feel it was a too high level, that it wasn't an intro level that yeah. they thought they were going to get? Yes, that's that's the feeling that I got. Okay. So, but we're talking about what's in the book. So I'm, I'm not clear on that because, and I would think that if you are entry level, you're learning from the top people. So I don't understand that. 
I, I agree. And I think I'm going to call uh, one of them today to get clarification on there because I want them back. And I think we do too. Tell them. Yeah. Okay. So just wanted to put that out there because I was a little taken aback by it. So let's begin with the um, Pareto principle, which I always knew it as the 80 20 rule. I didn't know about Pareto. So uh, the guy has finally gotten credit for what he discovered when he was planting his peas in his garden. That yeah. uh, we've always heard the 80 20 principle that. Um, 20% of the realtors do 80% of the business, which between you and me has probably gone to 90, 10. I so, agree. Yeah. I, I look at the numbers all the time. I, I agree. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> even, even worse in some markets. Yeah. Sometimes it's 95, five. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's really, really sad. So, but if nothing else, it will inspire you to be part of the five and 10% by, by following the principles and following the systems. So, um, because as when he says, the opposite is also true. When you focus on 80% of what doesn't matter, we tend to get 20% of the results we want. So both is true. Both, you'll be busy at work doing either, mm -hmm. but which will make you more productive and get you to the next level. Because the truth is that when actions are not focused on the 20% that matters, the results we want usually don't show up. Doing a lot of things is never a substitute for doing the right things. And we yeah. all know what the right things are. God knows if you're on the Zoom calls every single day, it's being badgered into your head. Lead gen, lead gen, lead gen. Um, yeah. yeah. Because when you're concentrating on leads, listings, and leverage, you're focusing on the key activities that, we, that will yield the greatest return on your business. Mm. You know, Orly, if I could just uh, jump in, I think, and it's uh, on the next page, so it's a kind of a segue. Um, we don't think that other businesses, your physician, your attorney, your accountant, are also in the lead gen business. I mean, how many times has your, someone you work with, a professional, asked, do you have any referrals for me? Yeah. Yeah. I went to a very young um, um, oh podiatrist, very young. So they whip out the iPad as I was leaving. Please go on Google, give us a review. Who do you know? I mean, it was very, very young and, and tech and slick. Yeah. So very interesting. You're right. You know, no yeah. matter what business you're in, you're in the lead gen business because Absolutely. no leads means no sales and you can never have too many leads ever. As he says, you can either cherry pick um, the leads if you're by yourself and you're juggling all the balls you take the balls that are obviously the low-lying fruit or you start to uh, build your lead system where you can leverage it which I don't want to you know and it's it's not just getting that one lead uh, it's getting a lot of leads so yeah. you can cherry pick and I think putting the systems in place because I think realtors when they start lead genning and they get a lot of leads it's really about clarity of what is your A, B, and C leads? Where am I going to focus a lot of time? Um, I just listed a house for 140,000. I'm getting so many leads. It was supposed to be cash only. I'm getting people who are saying, but I'm pre approved. Well, you're pre approved to 150. No offense. I can't help you right now. I said, you may want to sit out this market. You may want to go north, you know, further north. I'll refer you. But this is not a good use of my team's time right now to focus on those buyers when we've got buyers in a higher price point that can buy a more substantial house. Mm -hmm. Or even uh, people that are putting in low bids in this market. You right. can't wait, you know, not that you want to wait, you say waste time, <coughs> but uh, you have to say to them, if this is not a market where you're going to get a deal, right. so maybe you should wait it out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And, it's, and when you've got a lot of leads, you can afford to tell them, you may want to wait this market out. Maybe this market is not for you if you're looking to negotiate. This is not a market where you negotiate. This is a market where you do, you step up and do what you need to do. And if that's not in your culture and in your nature, then by all means, you know, come back in two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a, a good conversation might be. And during that time, how much rent do you think you're going to be spending? 
Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for obviously those who are going for a mortgage and the seller is accepting. Mm -hmm. um, and then giving them a reality check. So, hey, why don't you just jump in now? Because right. you're going to be spending, you know, upward of 40000 in rent the next two years. Very good point. Very good you, point. I just wanted to bring a point. You talked about leads, right? And I think Paula hit on the systems of, you're talking about a lot of leads coming in. And so at the same time, you need to create the system of what do I do with all of those people that even if the 150 guy can't buy right now, is he in a system that is going to keep you in front of him? And so when he is ready, that you're still the option because so many agents just throw leads away because we're too busy and they weren't ready to buy right now. And so um, creating systems around those leads, one. And another thing you mentioned was the vendors, Patty. So we all have a hairdresser, a, you know, a nail, a nail girl, uh, the tailor, the dry cleaner. Mm -hmm. And my favorite script, which always worked as an agent is Patty, I'm committed to, thank you so much for everything you've done for me over the years. I'm committed to helping 24 families this year. Can I count on you for one referral this year? And most wow. of the time that, can I just count just one, just one. If you go after yeah. 40 people that you're, you're literally giving business to, buying your milk from, uh, going to church and ask, ask for the business. Yeah. And even to just narrow it down to one, it gives a target. Just one. Just one. Right. Good morning, Arlene. Arlene did a beautiful job last evening with the career builders uh, discussing necessary paperwork. She did a great job. Got lots of thank yous. She's awesome. Yeah. Good Thanks, morning, Arlene, ladies. again. Ms. Cheryl joined us and Ms. Rasham. Good morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, Cheryl. Morning. morning. Sorry, I couldn't find the link. That's okay. <laughs> so do you have enough leads that if you close them properly, you'd be reaching your goals? Yeah. So that's a really good question because how many times do we have pieces of paper around or just names? And are those leads really, if, if you're not working them? Or have you qualified them and quantified them? How much effort you're going to give them? Yeah. And I think sometimes agents may think they have enough leads, but we all know uh, they end up buying their cousin's uncle's house, word of mouth, or um, you know they drive by a sign that just went up, and in this kind of market, you. Maybe you didn't pick up the phone right away. You're going to return the call, but they panic. Right. So they call the listing agent because they want to right. get in. So maybe those enough leads really aren't enough leads. And their, or their agenda changed. You know, I was on a Zoom call the other day with um, the morning mindset and somebody said how people are, go, you know, ghosting them it just disappeared. Well, mm -hmm. it's not about us. It's about them. Yeah. You know, I may go to buy a car this weekend and then, you know, didn't find what I wanted. I got busy with my life, work, whatever. And I'm going to put it off for a month because yeah. it's now not a top priority like it was at that moment. Yeah. So that car salesman thinks that I'm ghosting them or, you know, wasted their time, but it's just not my right time. But if that yeah. car salesman understands <laughs> and gives me permission to come back when I'm ready, then I'll be back. When I'm Interesting ready. though, Orly, I also have been car, car shopping and they kind of leave it up to the customer to reconnect Yes, correct. They're terrible salespeople. Yeah. <laughs> they they, they don't it. call back. I, we're, I not, we're not talking, you know. Ladies, I would have to question like our industry at times too. Like, do we always call back, right? This is where yes. the top really succeed is that we, that's the one secret. And I wish those agents that you were talking about were listening right now. The one secret is that I promise you, Paula and Orly, Cheryl, you've called back. Every, before we go to bed at night, everyone gets a return email because it bothers me. I cannot go to sleep. I don't want to wake up at three in the morning saying, oh my God, I forgot to call so-and-so back. Oh, Diana's it's constantly also, looking Diana. at our, our call rate. So we, we, we know what percentage we need to be in. So we track the percentage rate of mm -hmm. our, our answering calls. So I, can, I know exactly uh, how many times the girls are picking up where I'm picking up. So we have, we track so that. Paul, Paula made a really good point once because I was in her office and Patty was there and you said something to Patty and you said, Patty, you keep calling them until they tell you to drop dead. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
Yeah. You know, I was yeah. in the car the other day when I got one of those calls. You know, I saw your 140,000. I want to make a cash <laughs> offer, blah, blah, blah. I said, I already have multiple offers. Thank you very much. But I continued the conversation. The guy is from Fort Lee looking for a second home, can clearly afford more. So I converted him. We spoke, handed him over to one of my buyer's agents. So I didn't dismiss it because it was a $140,000 buyer because it's a second home and he's got cash. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes we'll get those calls and I'll tell the girls they, they don't always take it. I'll say, oh, OK, so remember the call that you got and uh, nah. he was calling on 150. Well, he thought he got a deal. But when you really talk to him, he can afford 500. Exactly. So you don't always know. You have to ask the questions. Absolutely. And Orly, I admire the fact that you reach out to everyone who's reached out to you. I think that is such a, a proper thing to do. It's etiquette, it's courtesy, it's respect. It's yes. also a reflection on our company. Thank you. But but yes, I mean, I've been getting a lot of calls from people that are desperate and I'm just sending them up to Vernon because they're such yeah. hard working. I had one guy, Raul, he said, I worked during COVID and I survived and I put my life at risk. I mean, you really feel for these wow. people who want to buy a house and just can't afford something in our area. So yes, you're a human being first and they appreciate the fact that I took the time to just talk to them. Good but also you. giving them value. And we, we assume that they know what the process is. That's right. They assume that if, they, if their lender told them go for FHA, but we know that FHA won't work in this market and they can do a different type of loan, then you educate them to say, if you can afford a different type of loan or put more money down, then that's what you should do to get a home today. But right. a lot of people are not giving that value, not giving that information. And we forget to do that sometimes. We just take it, oh, we take a phone call. We're not message takers. We, we can't just take messages or just say, we're not showing agents. We have to give value. Right. Or how many times did you say that house is under contract? Yes. Oh and my then God. I've heard that so many yeah. times. Oh, it's under contract, especially in this price point. I don't want to, because you don't want to deal with it, but that's a lead. Yeah. Really? So what would your response be to that person? That house just went under contract. However, I've got several other homes coming on the market. Tell me what you're looking for. And let me put you in the queue. So just before they come on, I can give you the heads up. Our A buyers, and if they're not, if I don't feel that they're loyal, I said my A buyers get the heads up when something is coming on the market. Do you want to be on that list? Give me all your contact information and we'll, and of course they all say, yeah. Of course, especially in this market. Mm -hmm. That's Thank great. You. Let me put you in the queue. Because they know things are flying off the yeah. And they're not even getting an opportunity. So, so can I just pivot for a second? Because oh. all of these opportunities that we're talking about come off of the lead generation to go get the listings. Correct. Right? Because we're talking about buyer opportunities that are literally just coming to you, coming to us, right. because we went and did the first activity of lead gen for the listing. And, and on page 102, I love this because these are the many virtues of a seller listing. And so when agents say to me, no, nah, I, I really work buyers. I'm really good with buyers. Well, this market, it's really easy for me to question, to say, well, let's talk about time and let's see how that pans out. But in other markets, it's really more natural for people to say, no, I'm more comfortable running with buyers. And I want us to like in this market, hone in on what are the virtues of the seller listing, because this is why we, we should be in business to hold the inventory. Um, yes, that's where you build your inventory. That's where you build your branding. That's where you get to the point where you get come list me calls. And the reason newer agents like to work buyers is because frankly, things is a one hour list interview, whether you're gonna get a job or not. And that's a little bit scarier because buyers don't pay you. So you right. can drive them around for six months, become their buddies. And if you don't have the skills to close them, then you've got a lot of friends, but you don't have a lot of commission checks. Where right. listing opportunities is really where you have to hone your skills. You have to hone your, your lead generation skill. You have to hone your presentation skills because you've got one shot to get that listing and build your inventory. And that's what it's all about. I mean, I can go in and out of a listing appointment, believe it or not, 
in 25 minutes signed. Wow. And 90% and 90% of my calls are come list me calls. I'm not even up against anybody. Orly list things when people don't even know they wanted to sell their house. <laughs> I've done that. They came in to inquire. Next thing I know, we've got a contract. They go, we were just coming to see what our house was worth. We didn't <laughs> be moving so quickly. Their heads are spinning. But, but yes. they were happy at the end of the day. I just knew what was good for them before they knew it. There you go. <laughs> but but that, that's how you hone your lead generation system and hone your skills where now listing leads are coming to you because they know your value. They're not even interviewing anybody else. They know who they want. They know the reputation. They know the results that they're going to get and they trust that they're in good hands. And, and I wanna take the fear away from the agent that says, well, I just don't know how I would price it or what if I had a listing lead, how would I? That's how you get good at it, right? You, you study the markets, you go out and see the inventory, you see what sold, when it sold a couple of years ago, what did that neighborhood go for? That is the real digging, the professional um, research that you need to do in order to show up at that presentation table, like you know what you're talking about because you actually did the research. But I think sometimes realtors out of desperation go everywhere, willy nilly. Mm -hmm. And I really built my business custom to Ringwood and then went around. So I know every street in Ringwood. I've sold some of those homes three and four times in my career that I can do a one, one shot listing appointment. I know the market. You have to know the market like the back of your hand. When they call you and they give you a street, the only question I ask them is, do you have the buy level with the, with the you know, bedroom in the basement or do you have the colonial with the spiral staircase? You know, you know that market. Yep. And now I can do a listing presentation. I mean, a listing of CMA. And of course I have a range. So when I come and see the house, I just, and I tell them, you know, I haven't seen your house. I did the, I did the, um, uh, uh, I did the CMA and I'll adjust it accordingly when I see your house, but tell me on a scale of one to 10, one being your house is a knockdown, 10 being pristine on, you know, HGTV, where do you, where is your house? And usually I get like a seven or if they're That's honest, awesome. maybe sometimes a five. So great. And if I get a 10, all right. I'll, and if I'll, you get there and it's really a one, then you're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, if it's a one, then, then it's an as is price. Either way, it doesn't matter. And, and if it was a one, there's also an opportunity for us as, as real estate investors right. to look at it and say, hey, who would, who would, who would this opportunity be perfect for? Could I partner with them? Could it be for me? Right. How can I help this person? Yeah. Um, also, in you get your time back, right? You have more control of your time when you work sellers. You know, there's there's usually you well, early just said 25 minutes and she secured the listing. Even if you're on an hour or even for some of us in the beginning, maybe it's two hours. We're chitty chatty. Ugh, I remember those days. And um, it's still two hours, not 12 hours on a Saturday, five Saturdays, right? Um, also is then you take it to what's your dollar per hour. Well, mm -hmm. when you're maximizing your time efficiency, then your dollar per hour is higher. And isn't that the goal to make a business that is the most profitable? Um, which is, can I just add to yeah. that? Um, with uh, Cheryl the other day, so Cheryl has a buyer's agent, right? And so, and I told this to my son too. And a cat and apparently. And a cat. <laughs> right? So, uh, she asked, well, how many do you give to your buyer's agent? And the only way you're going to manage your time is by giving those away so that you could really focus on your sellers. So a lot of times in the beginning, when you're transitioning to getting a buyer's agent, you need to understand that you're not giving away your part of the commission there necessarily. You're giving it away so that you have more time to secure more listings. You're taking back your time. I, I agree with you, Paula, a hundred percent when you get to our level. However, I gave Cheryl contrary advice because her buyer's agent is not seasoned or trained yet. She's still on probation. Right. Okay. So I would be afraid to go to okay. all the leads True. And, uh, until she's proven that she can convert, close and get them to the closing table. True. That True. was a hotter lead. So as the leader oh. gets to choose that buyer, and run with them herself while she gives the other buyers that would take more time to the new buyer's agent. So. I just thought it was another 
call. Right. I didn't know that how hot or how, you know, where the, but that well, was the point of view. Right. I think Paula's point is well made though, in that when, and I'm sure Cheryl's in this mindset, she's hiring a buyer's agent into the business so that she can be freed up to focus on listings. And her hope is that her buyer's agent will be able to just close Hey, 80% of the time, like you would close, I'd be good with it. Right. Mm. It's the 80, 20 year old. Um, yeah. Some are still going to fall through the cracks. It's not going to be you. And hopefully they get even better than you and they convert more than you. Yeah. However, yeah. the beginning part is a little bit True. challenging, but I do, Cheryl, I want to tell you, take both of their advice, but Paula is right in that at some point it's the 30, 60, 90 at that 90 day, you better be ready to let go of that hand. If not, you have the wrong hire. Yeah. Or you've not yeah, done the right thing with the 30, 60, 90 time. Yeah, she's only in her third week, but yeah, she's doing, she's doing super well. And I've been passing pretty much almost every lead to her. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. We're only going to find out if they can swim if we throw them in the water sometimes. Oh, mm -hmm. I throw it in the water. So we segued <laughs> into, into leverage. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Go ahead, no. Patty. 103, ladies. All right, so yeah. let, if you focus on the first two L's and do a great job, you will eventually have no choice but to either make less money or jump into becoming leveraged. An effective focus on leads and seller listings eventually brings you to the point where you have more business than you can possibly handle alone and will create the opportunity to start focusing on leverage. So the first hire, because a lot of people make the mistake of the first hire being a buyer's agent. I've got so many leads, somebody's got to run with them. Um, and I made a mistake in my early in my career. I did hire an admin, but I needed another buyer, buyer's agent and another admin. So I, I combined the two roles and I could have lost this person because they were working seven days a week, being an admin during the week, running with buyers at night and on weekends. And they almost burnt out until they very wisely came to me and they were great at both. That was the, the frustrating thing. Noreen sold her, you know, this buyer a house on her first open house. You know, she was amazing at both roles, but she came to me and said, I can't do this anymore. Um, I would like to be your full-time admin because she was part-time. And um, I said, fine. And I was scared. I was really scared because now my, my salary jumped. So now I've got more expense and who's going to take the buyers? So I said, but I, she said, I promise you, you know, it will work out. I said, you know what? I'm going to take that leap of faith. I'm going to hire you full time, but you now need to find me a buyer's agent. And mm -hmm. sure enough, she found me, Carol, who's with me now 19 years. She was a past wow. client of ours, just lost her job in the photography business, believe it or not. And um, she's still with me today, 19 years later. So and Noreen was with me for 22 years until she retired. So I got the best of both, but you have wow. to take that leap of faith and trust that if that person's telling you they want this job and they can do it, that's the best because it's coming from them. They're pushing you to the next level. And every hire pushed me 25% more in business and profitability. You know, Orly, that brings us to page 104, if you don't mind my jumping in. Yeah, please. please. Um, and leverage answers three questions uh, in your business. Who's going to do it, people? How will they do it, systems? And what will they do it with, tools? All right, so people, systems, and tools. And That's you right. just described a system or a process that you went through, selecting the people, instituting the systems and the tools. But in order to have the systems, and this is where I think a lot of agents falter they don't have the systems for themselves because it's all in your head what you do is kind of on automatic pilot which is great or you kind of wing it when you need to but if you don't have the systems in place for yourself i have a policy and procedure manual that goes back probably 25 30 years which we update and you can't delegate because mm. they can't see what's in your head and a lot of um a lot of team leaders do the seagull method. You know what the seagull method is? You fly in, you swoop in, you dump it on their desk and you fly out and you expect them to know what to do. Yeah. And then you, and then you blame them for not doing it correctly. 
yeah. or on time or whatever, because your systems were not there. Or you expect them to do it when you're not there. And in the beginning, you need to be there to train them. Yeah. So you're going a step backwards in order to go two steps forward. It takes time. It takes putting in and writing. It forces you to be in the office because somebody is waiting for you for guidance. So if nothing else, that's accountability. When you hire your first person, you now have to be there. You can't go to target in the middle of the day because you felt like it. It forces you to be a leader, a better leader, right? It forces you to show up, to be an example, be a role model. Exactly. Um, and a lot of people don't take that, they don't slow down enough to spend the time in that 30, 60, 90. I want to just make a point that page 273 in the book is where you will find the full seventh level path. So as the ladies were talking about bringing a buyer's agent, bringing an admin, 273 is earmarked always in your book because that is how you would naturally grow. Now we've changed a little bit, maybe with a show agent on a buyer side, and there are some adjustments to the model in the new version of the MREA. However, it's not that different. Um, and I just want to make a point that if you are a single agent, it still pertains to you. You still need to understand who is going to do it or what time you're going to do it. So it's time blocking your schedule that when do you show up as the admin of your business? When do you show up as the marketing side of your business? When do you show up as the lead generation, as the presenter? You need to put on all these different hats. So even though you may not have anybody in your world working inside your business, you have a fabulous team at the office. You have transaction coordination help. You have um, education, you have you know, marketing that can be created for you. So you have to leverage the tools and systems that we've put in place to support you as a single agent. But don't be mistaken that you do still have to think about what are those leverage levers for you. Um, and it all goes back to scheduling. It does, it absolutely does. And the next thing is that if we are, are working the plan, the goal is that we would see progress. We'd be moving the needle towards the goal and having clarity on our goal is great. And yet we need to measure. So what are the eight goal categories that a millionaire real estate agent has? Because tracking the numbers, although even if you're a new agent and you say, well, Paula just said something that rang my ear. She knows her, her, her pickup ratio. She knows she could probably tell if she's going to have a good year or a bad year just by the number of calls that come in and how many people pick up the phone, not even the conversion to appointment because she's looking at that, that lead measure instead of the lag measure, the lead measure for Paula's business is how many phones or how many phone calls and how many answers. That's it. It's ultimately going to result into closings and dollars. So if you put it this way, if you had a football game, could you imagine a football game without a scoreboard? No, not at all. It would, no. Yeah, to what's the point the that if you're really into football, you're not even only looking at the scoreboard, you're looking at the yards, you're looking at who is in, how many minutes they've been on the field. I mean, all sorts of measures. So when we look at page 109, we have um, about 15 minutes, 12 minutes left. When we look at page 109, there are eight goal categories of the millionaire real estate agent. And I want to dive into these because this is tracking your business. Tracking your business is not like, I feel really busy. I was in the office today. Lots of calls. <laughs> I, yeah. just emailed, I just emailed my buyer's agents for the second time, by the way. How many A buyers are you working with right now? Right. Now in, in our system, we have a pipeline tool, which that's something else that we could have our team members on is a pipeline so that at any given time, you're always, you can peek in, you I can help them. The way. Command. Oh my God. Lily and my admin showed me the other day. She goes, look how many CMAs you went on. Cause I'm always beating myself up. You know, if I don't do six a week, I'm, I'm beating myself up. And she goes, my God, you did like whatever 24 last month. I go, well, that's that's average. That's not enough. That's six a month. <laughs> that's six a week. No, no, no. That was just March. So, um, I, but but I, she made me feel good. Like oh, okay, I'm I'm all right. I'm gonna be okay. But no, I love that in command that you can see exactly how many opportunities you have, how many things in the pipeline, what the potential income that you will be making if you close all of this. I'm loving that. I'm mm -hmm. also loving the multiple offer negotiating tool that's in there too. That's awesome. 
leverage. Leverage. Yep. Yep. The system is good. I love on these eight goal categories where down it in the same box, but it says you need to set your in regards to each one of those goals, your someday, your three year, your one year, your one month, and your one week. I think we're real comfortable setting one year goals. Mm -hmm. But when we start to say, okay, so what's your goal for the month? What's your goal for the week? What's your goal for today? It uh, brings reality uh, at your doorstep. Mm. Yeah. Just have Paula come into your office, she breaks it down for you and puts it on a board. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe we'll have to have Paula do a little class for us. How does she break it down? <laughs> I took a picture. I hope you're following it. Um, two, two listings. All right, here you go. Okay, so the first goal category on page 110 is lead leads generated. So how many leads are generated? That would mean that all of the little pieces of paper have to come out of our pocketbooks, ladies. <laughs> all of the sticky notes have to go into a system. Uh, and look, even if you're not using commands, are you using an Excel sheet? Are you tracking everything that's coming in? I mean, it, command would be the easiest way, but I don't want to cripple us if we're not there yet. It, it, you got to keep track of your leads. And then you have to look at what the conversion rate for converting calls into buyer appointments and the conversion rate of converting calls into seller appointments. Keep your systems simple at this point. You know, I'm not a technology person either. So I used to have, um, when I was working with buyers, they would all go on a green intake sheet in a three ring binder because I need to tactily see them, feel them, write my notes on them, you know, mm -hmm. turn the page, make sure I called everybody. So as I'm turning the pages, I know I'm making progress. My, my CMAs, the minute somebody calls me for a CMA, whether they're ready now or five years from now, they go on my orange sheet. So I have binders of orange sheets. That's my intake form. Everything about them, as far as their contact information, I get to you know ask them what about their house, whatever it is. But and then they go into command afterwards. But that sure. this means more to me because I'm tactile and visual yep. than if I see them on a computer screen. So and and, I, and I'm sure this is just a stack of orange sheets that you've printed out. And when you, you grab one and you start writing on it. I have them in my computer bag. I have them in my car and I have them in the, in both offices. So no matter where I am, that orange sheet goes out and I check my admin. Somebody calls in for a listing, grab the orange sheet, ask them the questions. It's reminders of what the questions are there. That's a system. Awesome. So the second goal is listings. How many do we have, Cheryl? Oh, I, well, no, I have more listings than that, but Paula told me I had to have three listings by April 15th and I already have two. Okay. Excellent. Not counting the one you already had before I was there. New one. No, I'm counting two more. I got two come list me calls for Washington ground. <laughs> well, now you have to go after the not come list me. You have to go after the ones that are not saying come list me. Everybody needs a Paula. <laughs> <laughs> She's Cheryl, I'll celebrate master. the successes with you. I'll celebrate with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so the third category is contracts written. Uh, this is also something that you should be monitoring. If you're writing contracts and nothing is sticking, then we have to talk about your negotiating uh, ability. Or is it the clients you're working with? Or maybe you're not thinking out of the box and what you're saying to them, they're not going where they need to go to get the deal. So... I would tell you uh, also on the listing side, if you're taking listings and they're withdrawing from you, there's a problem there. Maybe there's an overpromise, under deliver. Maybe it's not the right qualified seller, whatever it may be. But we have to monitor number of units written, uh, closed written. Now I will tell you as a Keller Williams agent, if you do a green sheet for every transaction that you put together, that's where when you look at your multi-trends report, contracts written is a category that shows up. So if it's gotten to the point that it's gone to an attorney, you should be having a green sheet or it should be registered in the system as an under contract, I mean, a, a contract written. So our system will track some of this for you as long as you're using the system. All of these categories are in your multi-year trends report, 
which we could have a whole nother class on that. Um, so I should how many listing appointments I go on every month, how many listings I take. And when the market was down and I had whatever, 20, 30 listings, we, we were tracking how many expired on me, how many withdrew. I mean, I made my admin track that for me because yep. was my skills not good enough in to getting the price reductions? Uh, were we too busy trying to appease all the sellers that weren't selling and not being in touch with them enough and they withdrew from us? So that's where you know where the holes are. Or was I taking listings that weren't motivated enough to deal with that kind of a market? And that was a choice also. Yeah. Then I realized what it was costing me to list these homes that were now expiring. So maybe I, I was a little bit more scrutinizing. Do I really want to take this listing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I like the fact that you said um, that what you're looking at depends on what's going on in the market. If it we're in a strong seller's market, your eyeballs move to a little bit different place on your ledger. And if we're in a strong seller's market, uh, same thing. You're monitoring different things. Yeah. I, you know, and I love for those people who tend to not like to uh, claim they're not numbers people or whatever, at least choose two areas, track your leads and track your listings, track your leads and mm -hmm. then grow from there. That's a good starting point. And, and then, then the fourth to drill down. And then ultimately the fourth goal would be contracts closed. Everybody can track that. I know everybody knows that. Yeah. It's all That's the easy. stuff that, yeah, it's all the stuff that leads up to it that really should be tracked to show us how we get more of those closed units. The fifth goal is money. Now we'll get to that when we get to the budget model, but the fifth goal is actually monitoring your money. What was the closed income? Now, as a KW agent, it's in our face. At any point, could you ask your MCA to print out a report for you of everything that's closed, everything that's paid in? I mean, our system can give you anything. You also can find uh, some of that in your back end, which I could help you with. But you need to be tracking what are you spending? So what are you bringing in? And now what are you spending? What is your budget? How much are you truly spending? What is your net income? You know, most people will look at it and say, we, we talk about a 30, 30, 40, 30% 30 should go towards expenses. 30% should go towards other people, cost of sale, referrals, buyer agents. The other 40% is what you as an agent take home. Now, when you're a single agent, it's a little bit more. It's probably more like a 55 take home after all your expenses. But don't be mistaken that 100% of the commission is what you are taking home and what you're earning. And that is what I think a lot of agents without having conversations around their monies go, yeah, but I made, I made silver last year. So I did 10 million. 10 million is 250,000. Well, by the time you take it home, it's not 250,000. So we need to just be clear on that. What are our goals and how do we stay within our budget? Um, and then agent compensation. How do I, the agent, personally take uh, get to take home? What do you get to take home? When there, when you study those numbers, you will find a few things. One is we can control it by our commission that we take, and we can control it by the market that we go after. If you increase your price point and you increase your commission, you can put the same amount of hours and make more money. But that shows up when you're tracking. Okay. And then the sixth is the people. We talked a lot about the people, recruiting, training, consulting. We're going to get more into that, but Cheryl, was, that was a great example because Cheryl's brought on a buyer's agent and she's in the process of training. So she's in her 30, 60, 90 with her buyer's agent. And she's not expecting her to go take appointments right now, but she is passing the baton. And so that is the training. And then she's going to get more into a consulting position with her teammate because then it will be weekly. I don't need to micromanage you anymore, buyer's agent. Now we just need to be accountable. As Orly said, how many A buyers are you working? Let me see your pipeline. Let's talk about what the challenges are that you're having. And you're consulting more in a coaching manner rather than training and educating that buyer's agent to do the task. And those are the things that I don't think that many agents think about when they are going to enter into owning a business and running a team is the responsibility that you do have and I think, Orly, you're a great testament to have people working for you for 20 years. Mm -hmm. In this business, a lot of people don't stay in the business for 20 years. 
Yeah. Yeah. You must take good care of them, Morley. And I'm not just talking money. Well, That's right. Building, it's more about this. Yeah. yeah. Building culture. Yeah. When they and, succeed, I succeed. And then we talked about systems and tools. That's another category that a millionaire real estate agent tracks. What new systems or tools do we add? Now I'll tell you, many of us like shiny objects. And so this is where we do have to play red light, green light that what are we doing this quarter? What is working? What are we going to commit to this quarter? We're going to try this system. Okay. It's not working. Well, let's measure it. We need another three months to measure it. We're cutting it. We're upping it. We're getting another one. We don't just go spend money because we have to hold the tools and systems accountable. And also to Orly's point is start documenting everything because for me, it's not natural to sit there and write an operations manual. However, when I do something that I find myself doing over and over again, like telling somebody the same thing over and over, I create a little one sheeter. Mm -hmm. So then I'm like, let me pull that up so that it guides me in the conversation. Um, if we have to pull reports, let's say, I asked the admin, can you type that up how you did it? And put that in what's called now the operations manual for the coaching program. Because as you're doing things, let's document it so that we could just create a system out of what you're already doing. And then in the eighth goal category is personal education. And this is where, do you have a growth plan? What do you expect for the year for your training, for your mindset, for your uh, knowledge of the market and the shifting that's going on in, in, in the business. What do you need to learn? What knowledge do the individuals on my staff need to learn? And what skills do they need to acquire? And then making sure that your curriculum and your year is supporting that goals. Because that's another problem that I do find. And Orly said it before, we hire somebody and soup, we're out. We think we, we did a good job. We put somebody in the seat. We have somebody working for us. But the reality is they need training also and they need to be brought into our vision and they need to understand what our goal is. And so with that, um, personal education on ourselves and our team members is really important here. And keep it focused. Um, you know, a lot of us are, I know I am an education junkie, but just learning all the time and going in different directions in your mind is sometimes too much, too much. So sometimes when I go to a conference or I'm listening for something, I'm, I'm really saying to myself consciously, what do I need right now to take me to the next level so I can block out the noise of all the other great ideas? They're great ideas. Don't get me wrong. And I do write them down in a notebook. But then I go back and I highlight only those three that pertain to where I am right now. And then I'll maybe visit the others another time or maybe never until I hear it again, because I'm now ready to implement that. So don't try to just catch everything all at once because it will be, it will be failure. You're setting yourself up for failure. There are tons of good ideas out there. As I tell my team when we brainstorm, but without implementing them, they mean absolutely nothing. So even if you chose one thing to focus on in the month of April, what is the one thing that I need to learn and master whether it's a listing presentation, whether it's lead generate, whatever it is, pick that one thing that you want to master this month. Listings. <laughs> awesome. Okay. Um, so we get to the end. 116 is the conclusion. I'm talking about points to remember. Think a million. How you think matters. We, we started with that. Um, thinking big. Work to learn before you work to earn. The nine ways the millionaire real estate agent thinks. We went through that part, which is thinking uh, by a big why, big goals, big models, possibilities, action without fear, progress, comp uh, co competitively, standards, and think service. Then we went into the 80-20 rule, which is um, the rule is always at work with leads, listings, and leverage. 20% of your focus ultimately gives you 80% of your results. So lead generation is never a passive activity. It is not on oil autopilot. Listings are the high leverage maximum earning opportunity. And leverage is the who, how, and what of a powerful real estate sales team. Bring the power of goal categories into your business and business people know their numbers. Know your numbers. Leads, listings, and leverage.
All right, ladies. Job, girls. And next week, page 128 to 172, big one. Yes. Let's try to encourage another person to get on with us for next week. I know it's spring break this week and we have a couple of people that are away and with kids. Uh, so let's really encourage our family to get on for next week because we are going to go into the models. What was the, uh, the, the, what, tell me the pages again, Patty? 128 to 172. It's a lot. No, 119 to one, yeah, 119 to 172. Right. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Just skip over. I did notice yeah. that, but I'm just going by the handout. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She okay. is right. And I will encourage you also that as you're reading through this, you can keep revisiting page 123. Page 123 just keeps bringing you back to the four models and what they mean so we can have real clarity around it, okay? Excellent. All right, have Excellent. a fabulous, fabulous day and the rest of the week, we'll see you next week. Have a great productive weekend and do something nice for yourself this weekend also. Thank Guys, you. bye everybody. <laughs> bye bye. bye.